Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 54 of the Camino Voice. On this episode, I speak to a former Washington State Senator. Please welcome Mary Margaret. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, I got to speak to Mary Margaret, who is a former Washington State Senator, um, but she also uh, was a House was a legislator in the House of Representatives for Washington. So, um, but I've been actually trying to uh, interview Mary Margaret for a while now. I just wasn't able to get a hold of her, um, but I've been looking forward to this interview for a long time because I actually went to Boy Scouts with her grandson and. Um, So I would actually see her. She would come and speak to our Boy Scout troop that I was a part of. Um, And we even got to do a tour of the offices with her. Um, And that was mainly because her grandson was in our Boy Scout troop. So um, I knew of her and I knew um, I knew a little bit of what she did as far as just from those those uh, tours and stuff like that. And then I also knew of her because Mary Margaret did a lot of work in trying, or not trying, but in helping get uh, Camino Commons, so where I'm at now, uh, built. And my dad has always said that, that that this place would not exist without Mary Margaret. And so um, not only did she serve our state and, and do a lot of good work there, but she also did so much for Camino Island. Um, Camino would not be anything of what it is today without the work that Mary Margaret had put into this place. So um, it was really, it was a great honor to be able to talk to her. Um, she's also grown up here on the island. She has a ton of history of here on the island. She remembers it from um, way back and then just seeing it change all the way till the present day. Um, and, uh, yeah, so just, uh, great lady to talk to, had a great conversation. Um, because of our conversation went a little long, I broke this into two parts. So this is going to be the first part of our conversation. Um, and you can come back next week for the second part, but without further ado, here's my conversation with Mary Margaret. Hey Islanders and welcome to another episode of the Commando Voice. Today I'm here with a former Washington Senator. Welcome to the podcast, Mary Margaret. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, I've been looking forward to this podcast for a while. Um, So before we get started on everything, uh, tell us a little bit about Mary. Well, Mary Margaret Haugen, I was born here on Camino Island. And actually, I live a quarter of a mile from where I was born. And I'm married, and my husband and I have 10 children between the two of us. We have a blended family. Okay. And we just feel real fortunate to get to live here still. Very cool. All right, so you said you were born here on Camino Island. Um, what was it like back then? Well, of course, when I was born, it was 1941, and so it was during the war. Okay. And so it was a different place. The earliest I remember is my, I have a, five older brothers, and my three older brothers went to war. And by the time I was three years old, they were gone. So I don't really remember them. But what I do remember is of the war period of time, because what I mostly remember was how important the mail was. Mm-hmm. My mother looked forward to the mail every day. And if it wasn't a letter from my brothers, and the mailman went to town and found there was a letter, he'd come back and bring it back out to us. Okay. But I didn't go to school on the island, but my older brothers did, as did my parents. My grandparents, my grand, maternal grandparents actually came from Oklahoma okay. in 1911. And um, my paternal grandparents actually were Norwegian immigrants and came to Camino via South Dakota and Lopez Island. Okay. An interesting fact is that both my grandparents served on the Camino School, or Ratsalati School Board. And really? I didn't find that out until later years. <laughs> <laughs> I often wondered how my folks got to know each other, but they both served on the school board together okay. at Ratsalati. Oh, very cool. And my, my, brother, my dad went to school there, and my mother went to school at Rocky Point. Ratsalati District had two schools, one at Ratsalati and one at Rocky Point. And my mother went to school at Rocky Point, and my dad went to school at Utsalati. Okay. It was only till the eighth grade. And then my older brothers, my three older brothers, actually went to school on Camino. Okay. But by the time I came along, we were into Stanwood. Okay. 
So were you guys living in Stanwood at that point? Then? No, we were living on the island, but the schools had consolidated. Oh, okay. And so there was no longer schools on the island. And that was happened in, well, I think about 1936 is when it happened, so it was long before I went to school. Okay. But I went to school in Stanwood, rode okay. the school bus. At that time, there were two buses on the island. One went on the north side and one went on the south side. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to believe, I know, but that yeah. was... And uh, there weren't a lot, of, a lot of people living on there when I was growing up. My dad was master of the Grange, and so we used to go to the Grange all the time. Yeah, okay. And there was probably maybe 500 people living at the island during that time. But it was during the war, and so people didn't go many places. But I remember going to the Grange with my folks. <clears throat> my dad worked in the shipyard, and he carpooled to Everett. Okay. But we lived on a farm, mm-hmm. although I questioned the word farm because it truly really was a... A stump farm. My grandfather actually had hewed it out of the wilderness. Okay. And uh, we had cows and chickens, and we sort of lived off the land. I don't ever remember being without, although I know a lot of people were during that period of time. Mm-hmm. But I was so young, I just remember the war because of my brothers. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Um, so you said your dad was part of, with the South End Grange. What was what was his role there? He was a master of the Grange for about eighteen years. Okay. And they were he was active during the time uh, the state park was formed and during the time they picked up Cavalera's Beach. In fact, I was to the opening of Camino Island State Park in nineteen forty eight. I was a young girl, I was only <laughs> eight years old, but I was there with my parents. They helped on that project. Oh, very cool. That must have been really cool to see that. It was. Of course, you know, eight years old, you aren't really recognizing what you're seeing. Right. (laughs) But uh, it really has changed a lot. It was the south end of the island was a long ways away. It was way down, it seemed like, because, of course, there was only the two roads at that time. And it was long roads with trees hanging over. (laughs) Yeah. And was it probably wasn't was it paved at that point? Well, it was paved. Okay. The main roads were paved. Yes. Got it. Very cool. So what was... Um, okay, so you, you were... You'd been part of that then. So the, so that's weird. So Atsalati used to have a school. Atsalati has the first school here on the island. Okay. It was 1864 was the first school, and it was Atsalati School District. Wow. And the original school was at the mill site. And okay. then in about 1908, they bought land over what's called New Atsalati. That's the other part of Atsalati. And okay. that's where they moved to school. Now, okay. my father went to school at Millside, but my brothers went to school at, at the one New Atsalati. And it's still sitting there, but it's a private home now, the schoolhouse okay. is. Got it. And um, my grandmother was the pre- first president of the Atsalati Ladies' Aid, which was formed to help with the s- kids at the school. They had help with the kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they eventually built their building in 1925. Okay. And that's where the kids used to hold their programs. Okay. And that's what my brother tells me, my brother who experienced that. Yeah. So was that, is that the, that's, is that the Atsalati lady, Ladies Aid Building? Or that's is it, the Atsalati Ladies Aid Building. And that's the one that was built then? And the, it was built in 1926. Okay. And it, at the cost of $566. <laughs> It was primarily built by uh, the locals building it. The lumber yeah. was was actually came from Jack well, Jack uh, Brown's mill, which was at Gertie's Road down there. He had a mill down there. Okay. So that's when the lumber came from the for the building. Okay. And the original building didn't have plumbing in it. Of course, mm-hmm. it didn't even have electricity at about thirty four, and so it was a, just a building. But yeah. I remember my brother telling me that he thought it was the biggest building he'd ever seen. <laughs> Because the kids from the school would go there and have their programs. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So then, when uh, I guess during your growing up time, did you guys have running water? And I mean, you were North End, so did you have like water, electricity, all that, or did that kind of slowly come as you were growing up? Well, the up? electricity came about in the late thirty or early thirties. It came early thirties. Okay. And we had electricity, and we had a well. My dad had actually dug the well. Okay. And uh, we had indoor plumbing, but I. We didn't have it until after the war. When my brothers came home, they put indoor plumbing in the house. Okay. But there was a lot of people living on the island still that didn't have indoor plumbing. Yeah. And had wells. There actually were people who had, like, almost pumps. Okay. You know, old-fashioned pumps instead of on a well rather than running water to the house. Okay. It was a very different time then. You know, people were very neighborly. Mm-hmm. They helped out each other uh, during harvest season. 
when hay had to be held, brought in, uh, families would come and help. And I remember helping my mom cook big meals for this hay crew that would come. Oh, very cool. And then my brothers would go to other people's farms and help them put the hay in. It was, a, it was a different time. People helped each other. Yeah. You knew who your neighbor was. Right. How Do you know any of the, uh, or I guess, can you recall, like, the names of the farms and stuff like that, or farmers that were, oh, yes. you guys were helping during that time? Well, there was the Danielsons and the Johnsons and the Linksteads, and Ole Botten had his farm there, too. It was, you know, it's always interesting. The farms, I always question when we call them farms because they were very small, mm-hmm. but most people had hay. Okay. And so they would trade back and forth and okay. for each other. Mellums, the Mellums, Johnny okay. Mellums had a farm up on the hill. The Gulfs, there were a lot of families who had small farms. Okay. They'd help each other. Yeah. Very cool. And you said most of it was hay then? Well, that most people had cows, milk cows. Okay. And actually, there actually was milk came out, uh, came, Dairy Gold came out and picked up the milk. Oh, okay. I remember that well because my father, when I was, I can in the middle of the school age, my dad went to Alaska fishing. And so we had to take the milk down to the, and put it up on the, the, they had kind of a little stand in which you put the milk up on. Okay. And I remember struggling to get that can up on the milk stand because it was heavy. Yeah. You, had, you kept it, kept it in, a, in a trough in the, in the milk house and then you take it down in the morning. Okay. We actually had a milking machine, but it was pretty antiquated. Okay. <laughs> When I was a kid, but my brothers milk hand by hand. Okay. And we had to do a lot of milking by hand also. Yeah. So oh. did you guys? Ha- oh, go ahead. We had chickens. Okay. And everything. My dad was kind of a liked to have all kinds of animals. Okay. Everything but goats. Okay. <laughs> did you not like goats? Oh, I. It just wasn't something that he like. They're kind of a pesty animal, you know. Right. They eat everything. They eat everything, <laughs> and they get in everything also. <laughs> Very cool. So you guys, um, so you guys said you guys had a lot of different farm animals, stuff like that. Was that pretty common for your neighbors and stuff? Then most of them have at least an assortment of animals. Most people had little farms. Okay. There were people like Herman Moe who lived on the corner. He had a gas station in Stanwood. Okay. So he lived on the island, but he had some land also. We, you know, and had some farmland. Mm-hmm. But uh, most people were people living on the island. There were a few men who were in the fishing industry who just did fishing. Okay. Uh, smelt fishing and, and regular fishing. Yep. Uh, but to the greatest extent, it was primarily just small farms. Okay. And people living off those farms. Yeah. During the war, my, of course, my brother tells me uh, a lot about what happened. And they used to, the ship, the um, seaplane base was across, uh, that's a lot across, on Whidbey Island. Mm-hmm. And they used to practice bombing out in the middle of the bay. Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, it was kind of an interesting experience. In fact, we have a picture, the ladies' aid. The ladies' aid's philosophy is we save the past for the future. And we have a picture of a seaplane landing on this beach over, just outside of Gertie's Road there okay. to get to buy fish and crabs from one of the local fishermen. Oh, very cool. So we have pictures from the history of that time. Yeah. One of the interesting things we did at the ladies' aid, we did history nights for a while, and we had... Five of the students who went to school at Utsalati School okay. who came and talked about what it was like to go to a one-room school at Utsalati. It was a fun evening, and it's just hilarious to listen to them. They actually had some very colorful stories to tell. Yeah. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah, I mean, that's, like, for you, so you, you start going to uh, school in Stanwood. What school were you going to then? Well, that's where I went to school in Stanwood. In the, the, the Stanwood, where the Stanwood Elementary School is, yep. that's where the school was that I started at. Okay. That was also where there was a high school at one point in the time. Okay. Now, my brothers, they came in 1935, they came into Stanwood. Utsalati School District was pretty progressive. They actually made arrangements with the Stanwood School District to allow, not the Stanwood School District, to allow the students to come in for the, um, take, take math and such like that, mm-hmm. because they didn't offer much in a one-room schoolhouse. Yeah. So they actually had the first school bus on the island that brought kids into Stanwood okay. School. Okay. But by the time I got there, uh, it was... Actually, I went to kindergarten, which is kind of amazing because in my generation, not many kindergartens. must have been just after the... It was right after the war. Mm-hmm. And so, interesting, really, we went to school in the school in Stanwood, and it was the kids from the island and the kids from Warm Beach yeah. that came to the Stanwood School. Okay. There was also a school on the hill where Lincoln is. Yeah. That was an elementary school, too. So many of my friends that I grew up with 
ended up going there to, kin- to first grade. But kindergarten was in Stanwood. Okay. And I still know people I went to kindergarten with. Oh, very cool. Still good friends. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I can remember it because we had to take naps, and I had never had to take a nap. <laughs> and I was horrified. And the boy who was in the bunk above me had a problem wetting the bed. And I used to lay there constantly in fear that, <laughs> that he was going to wet the bed. <laughs> I'm just scared to death. <laughs> But I didn't dare say anything. <laughs> That's one of my horror memories from kindergarten. <laughs> was uh, Mickey was going to wet his bed. Uh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah, I remember, I, I think I did, it, must, it could have been at kindergarten or it could have been at like a, a camp, um, but whether they did nap time. And I was a terrible napper. I just, I was so hyperactive. Mm-hmm. Um, so like they'd say, sit on the carpet and just take a nap or just sit quietly. And it was like, the hardest like 10 minutes of my life, like <laughs> sitting there, not moving. And so uh. I did remember vaguely when riding the school bus, uh, some of the men, young, the young men who'd come back from the war, they oh. went back to school because like my brothers, they went when they were in like juniors, they went to war. So they came back to, and went back into Stanwood to get refreshed before they went to college. And so they would ride the school bus. And it was so amazing because, you know, they all looked like giants to me. But, yep. And they were old. They'd all been in the war. They were all, in, you know, 22, 23 years old. Wow. Some even older. And they rode the school bus in. But I remember seeing those young men. Yeah. But like my brothers, my brothers went on to college, but they did go and take some classes in Stanwood. Yeah. And that's, that's just crazy when I think back to think, like, that young of people going to war. Oh, it really was amazing. Yeah. Yep. Very young. Yeah. So you said uh, your three older brothers? Mm-hmm. I have five older brothers. Okay. And my three older brothers were, my oldest brother was 18 years older than I, and then one 17, one 16 years older. And so those were wow. the three oldest ones. Okay. Then I had a brother who was eight years older than I, and one that was 18 months older than I. Okay. <laughs> and then they had me. <laughs> Probably to much relief of your mom, like um, another a daughter finally. <laughs> Well, I think what's another story that I've been told is when my brothers came, didn't my, they didn't know my mother was pregnant with having me. I can't hardly believe it because my mother wasn't a very big woman. And they came home to school and I was there. <laughs> they were horrified. <laughs> and I have been told by their friends that they remember when my brothers went to school and told them that they had a sister. <laughs> so I have lots of people who record my birth. <laughs> were they pretty excited? I don't think they were excited. Oh, no. <laughs> my, my brothers thought it was kind of silly. My, I, my mother was 40. My dad was 48. They probably thought they were ancient. Okay. You know, and having a child was seemed pretty old. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. I like to, people like to think, say, you were spoiled when you were the last of a big family like that. But my brother, who was just older than I, was sickly. And oh. my mother had had five healthy children and one sickly one. And guess who got babied? It wasn't me. It was right. he. <laughs> and he's still a baby. <laughs> Very cool. And where, um, where are your siblings now? Well, all of them are gone, with the exception of the one who's just older than myself, and he's living in Arizona. Okay. He was, his name was Thor, and actually had the beauty shop here on Camino Plaza. Okay. Thor Olson, a lot of people knew him. He was kind of a character. Yeah. Oh, very cool. He retired in Arizona then? Or? He's living in Arizona. Yeah, he retired down there. Okay. He married a lovely Hispanic woman, and they like it down there in the hot weather. Yep. Yeah, I, there's a lot of people that, that retire from here and go down to Arizona, and uh, we did the opposite migration. We moved from Arizona and moved up here, so... I think you're wise. <laughs> All right, very cool. So then um, you went to um, elementary school and stuff in, in Stanwood. Mm-hmm. Did you continue through high I, school there? I went to Stanwood High School. Twin City High School, when I graduated, it was called. Okay. And is that the one, is it where... It was in the middle school now. Okay. That was the high school when I was young. Okay. And how big were, like, your classes as you were going through? Were they... Well, there was about 70 of us graduated. Hmm. So they weren't very large. It's interesting, you know, by the time my children went to school, um, Kathy, who was, like, 20 years after I graduated, I think she had 200 kids in her classroom. Wow. You know, it really grew fast. Well, yeah. And then the the latest graduation from this year, I think, was... uh, 400 or something like it was a really big number when I saw it I was like oh I didn't I guess I didn't realize how big it is now well you were quite a few in your class yeah yeah and um I was homeschooled so I never really saw it on that scale 
I, oh. you know, I, for me, I, you know, I graduated with like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> we did a homeschool graduation. It was pretty mm-hmm. small. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. So I never really like, I didn't go to Stanwood High or anything like that. So I didn't really experience like how many kids were going through those doors. Yeah. It was a pretty good size. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, you know, always, Stanwood has always been in technology as being a primary <clears throat> feeder of that school, but the truth of the matter is a lot of the kids came off of Camano Island and from Warren Beach mm-hmm. and as far north as Cedarholm. It was a very large school district. Yeah. Yeah, just because there's a big area over there that, mm-hmm. you know, all these, like, smaller districts don't really have a high school to go That's to, true. so they, they gather all And when they things. consolidated them all, there were schools in, there were schools in Warren Beach and there were schools in Savannah and there were schools up in Cedarholm. There were a couple of schools up there. Okay. And there was one up towards... Um, Milltown, mm-hmm. and so when they consolidated them all and put them in Stanwood, then it became a much larger school district. Right. But even when I went to school, it was small by comparison. I was on the school board in Stanwood, and there were 1,200 students in there when I was on the board, and that was the 1970s. Okay. Wow. Very cool. So then what, <clears throat> um, so you were, you grew up on the island, and you graduated high school. What was, um, when did, I guess, first of all, when did your brothers, like, come back from the war? Well, they came back in the mid-40s. Mid-40s, okay. And went to college. My oldest brother was the first member of our family to graduate from college. Oh, very cool. It was pretty exciting in our family. Yeah. But I didn't follow my brothers on to college. I actually, when I graduated from high school, I went to beauty school. Okay. And my mother said I had to be self-supporting before I could get married, and I wanted to get married, so I went to beauty school. (laughs) (laughs) Needless to say, uh, I became self-supporting then. But I... Got married when I was young, and I had four children, and I actually had a beauty shop here on Camino Island. Okay. Where was that? I I had it in my home. We built one in the beauty shop in the house that I don't live in now, but right next door. Okay. Oh, very cool. So I lived there. Well, we were there for um, almost 45 years I lived in that house until we moved in the house we are in now. Wow. Okay. And that's, that's a long time. Wow. Very cool. Well, I have, like I say, I live a quarter of a mile from where I was born, so I can't say I've been too far away. Yeah. So how long did you run the uh, the beauty salon then? I had my salon about 30 years. When my boys finally got out of school, I didn't have to work anymore at being a beautician. But by that time, I was in the legislature. Really? Okay. So wait, you were doing both then? Well, the legislature in the state of Washington is a part-time legislature. Okay. Not so much now, but then it still was. You know, you're in session one year for 100 days and another year for 60 days. But now it seems like it's almost year-round. Yep. And it was when I left. It was still a lot of work going on year-round. Okay. But uh, I was able to come home and go back to work. And my brother had the beauty shop at Camino Plaza, so I used to send my customers to him. Okay. They were always glad when I came back. <laughs> I feel like there's a little bit of sibling rivalry. <laughs> no, not really. I ended up catching up with him in school, and so he always kind of made my life unbearable. <laughs> uh, so you said he was sickly when he was younger, right? What was um, what was kind of the sickness? Well, he was just real premature, and it took him a long time oh. to mature. Okay. I'm not sure he is yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody okay. who knows Thora know that's my statement is he's kind of a fun guy. Yeah. Yeah, well... You know. I was always serious, and he wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. No, I, you know, I don't... Maturity is is very uh, varied at this point. That's for sure. <laughs> okay. So then you got married, and you had four kids. Mm-hmm. Um, then what kind of happened through that? So you had started your salon in your house, mm-hmm. and then what kind of happened after that? Well, actually, I worked for somebody in Stanwood before I built my beauty shop. On that. I worked in Margaret's Beauty Salon in Stanwood. Okay. But then we built on the island. And I, my daughter started school, and she had problems with reading. And one of my concerns was that there was no remedial reading for her. Mm-hmm. My husband was with the state patrol. He didn't make a lot of money, but we still made more money than we could qualify for special education at that point. Okay. And so I thought all children should have remedial reading. So there was an opening on the school board, and I ran for the school board. Okay. And I got elected, and, and my goal was to make sure that children could have remedial reading all the way through high school. Mm-hmm. Because if you can't read, you can't do anything else. Right. So that sort of was the beginning of my political career. And I spent 11 years on the Stanford School Board. Okay. Years. An interesting fact is that both my grandparents 
My grandfather Huntington and my grandfather Olson served on the school board at Utsalati. Okay. Yeah. And my father was on the school board in Stanwood School Board, and he was on, uh, he was on the Utsalati School Board. And when the schools left the island, he was still on the board. When the schools came back to the island, my daughter was on the school board. <laughs> so you have a whole family history. Of- we have a lot of interest in education in this community. Yeah. That's what it's really about, you know. My mm-hmm. grandfather, who came here from Lopez, came because he had 13 children, and they didn't have education opportunity in Lopez, so he came to Camino. Not that there was a lot here, but that's where he came. Yeah. Yeah. That's So how did you guys, I guess, how did, or do you know how they got to Lopez Island then? They actually came from train on by train from South Dakota to Bellingham, and then they took a boat from Bellingham to Lopez Island. Okay. And then from Lopez Island to Camino, the story and the family is they they had came on a scow. I know that much. They had a scow which was being pulled behind a boat, and uh, they had loaded all these thirteen children, <laughs> and a cow with a crooked horn, <laughs> and they came through Deception Pass and landed at Utsalati. Okay. And the family lore was that they were had to fight off. The Ireland boys, it was a family living on an island named Ireland, and they had a bunch of boys, and they were on the beach when they landed, and they had to fight them off. Well, I think that's <laughs> family lore, but that's what they landed at Utsalati. Okay. And my grandfather, Huntington, who they came by train from Oklahoma to, well, which, well the farmhouses, um, about that used to be a train station went out there mm-hmm. in, in Skagit County, the farmhouse. Yeah. And so they came there, and then they went to Laconner, and then came from Laconner by boat to Utsalati. Okay. Very cool. Is the Huntington related to the relation to the Huntington Bay area on Camino? No, no Huntington, Huntington Store. Huntington Store. My uncle started the Huntington Store. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. One, one of my fa- mother's brothers was Vernon Huntington. Okay. There were eight of those children, and there was 13 of the Olsons, so... Okay. I always say that my grandfathers on both sides had an interest for education because they all had so many children. They <laughs> populated the schoolhouse. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess, you know, if you have a lot of kids, then you're focused on their education. And Well, maybe. I think both, both my grandparents realized that that was important. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to have education, as my father did, and I like to think I had the same priorities. Yeah. And my children had the same priorities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So then... So they, um, so then there's, I guess that's kind of a loaded question, but there's a lot of Olsons that I've met on the island. Are many of them, it's a fairly common last name. So do you know if there's a lot of Olsons that still live on the island that are descendants? No, not a lot of my father's family living here. Okay. Um, we had, I had an uncle and two living here. The Huntingtons, there were more Huntingtons than there were Olsons. Okay. Um. My father and his brothers worked in the logging industry, and so they lived all over. Oh, okay. You know, and ended up back here. My father was the one son who was chosen to come back and live on the family farm. Okay. And so that's why my folks, my father ended back back here. Got it. Okay. But Olson's is spelled two way. One has S O N and one S E N, and we were E N's. E N's. Okay. <laughs> Got it. But you know, my because there were so many. Family members, some of them married into other families, like we had people who married into the Johnsons and the Ralsons and such. At one time, everybody was related to everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes it a good, you know, easy for family reunions and stuff. Well, it does make it interesting. <laughs> I laughed at Nathan came home one time when he was young, and it was one of my cousin's daughter was living here on the island, had a daughter in school with Nathan. She, Nathan said, This girl said to you, she was my cousin. <laughs> You don't always know who all your family are when you come from such big families. <laughs> right. You get down two or three generations. Yeah. Well, and I'm not great at, I'm like, I'm pretty bad at fa- tracking family and stuff like that. And we've, um, you know, we moved from Arizona to up here. And um, we moved up here when I was like five and probably started stopped visiting super often down to Arizona when I was probably in my like early mm-hmm. teens. Um, so I've gone down for family reunions or um, or like funerals or things like that. And I'm we'll be sitting around like a, a campfire and I'm like, so this is a weird question, but am I related to you? <laughs> well, I, that's true. When Basil and I were married, I said, I'll introduce you to people that are my cousins, but don't ask me what their last names are. <laughs> I know they're my cousins, but I'm, you know, they've married somebody else and have a different name because you just, <laughs> you just don't know when you come from large families. Yep. Yeah. No. So yeah. Family tracking. My wife is great at it. She can tell me her whole family tree and then their extended family and, like, 
She's really good at keeping track of all of that. Yeah, I can tell my descendants but and my siblings and my grand- and nieces and nephews, but that's about as far as I go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm wondering if when I get to that age, if I'll be that good or not. <laughs> well, now I have all these wonderful ancestries and stuff that keep track for you. I keep getting messages, are you related to this or that? So and I'm thinking, probably, but I'm not really interested at this point in my life. <laughs> You're like, my family's large enough right now, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So then you were doing, um, you were on the board of the school. Stanwood School District. Stanwood School District um, for 11 years. What was... Um, you know, initially you said you got in for the reading, but then what, what kind of kept you going and, and staying with it? Well, I actually came from a family of activists. All my family were activists. Okay. If you didn't like what was going on, you got involved and made a difference. And so that was probably the primary reason I started on the school board was because I wanted to make a difference. But education has always been important in our family. Mm-hmm. And it was just really fun to be able to help make sure that the children in this school district was getting good education. I really loved the time I served on the school board. find it some of my most rewarding time because there was a lot of things happening during those years in the 70s with education. Yeah. What were some of the things that were going on during that time? Well, of course, during that time, we didn't pass levies for quite a while in Stanford, so it was really hard. And the state wasn't funding the schools properly. In fact, that was one of the reasons... I went to Olympia as a board member lobbying for full funding of education. Okay. And when I was down there, you know, I thought, well, I can do as good a job as those guys. Because <laughs> they weren't doing a very good job funding education, and they didn't for years, and I didn't help them much either. But the fact of the matter is, it, you know, I saw it as something that a citizen could be involved in. Yeah. And so when there was an opening for a state representative, I ran for office. And it's been interesting. I, I was... When you're at a school board, you're a nonpartisan person. Okay, yeah. And so I had to choose a party. Well, my family had traditionally been Democrats. And uh, I originally thought, well, I had I'd been real active in the community. We had a called a Camino Homeowners Association at that time on the island. It was kind of an activist group. And I was vice president of that. And a couple of the gentlemen I worked with tried to convince me to knew that I was interested and wanted me to run as a Republican. And I thought, oh, well, it doesn't make any difference. Yeah. But... My mother's brother came over one day, and his wife had her hair done. He was out in the car, so I went out and sat down. I said, my mother was dead at that time. And I said to my Uncle Ransom, I said, I've decided to run for the legislature. And he said, oh, your mother would be so proud of you. I said, i got to tell you something, Uncle Ransom. I've decided I was going to run as a Republican. And he said, you could win as a Democrat. And I knew right then I had to be true to who I was, because mm-hmm. I was born a Democrat, whatever that means. <laughs> but I had been raised in this family, in my and that was always more leaning towards the democratic philosophies at that yeah. time. Anyway, that I decided I'd run as a Democrat. Okay. Well, at first, the Democrat Party didn't support me. And okay. So, and I, in fact, I had little support from a lot of people. But I decided I was going to raise $1,020 bills. And I still remember I was cutting a man's hair in my shop, and he said, I, I said, I'm going to run for the legislature. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. He says, I'm going to try to raise... T- Twenty thousand or ten thousand twenty dollar bills. And he says, I'll give you twenty bucks. I always remember that. <laughs> John gave me my first twenty dollars. But when I ran for the legislature the first time, I had no real support from the party. Mm-hmm. And during the primary, because it was a primary race, and uh, just people I've known my whole life. And by that time, we had a big family. We got lots of cousins living all over the place. And I had been active in the school boards association, so I knew a lot of people in other districts. The district was very large at that time. Okay. It went way all the way from the top of the Cascade to the northern tip of, tip of, of Woodby Island. Okay. So I had like Darrington, Concrete, and all those small communities, and I knew a lot of the members of the boards from the school districts. So they were helpful, and um, I won the primary. I still remember that. It was kind of startling. And then the Democrat Party decided they were going to help me. <laughs> uh, okay. And so they came and said, we'd like to do a mailing for you, because those days mailings were important. And I said, that's great. And I was really naive. I didn't know much about it. And so they said, we'll print it for you, but you had to mail it from your own home address. So they brought it to me. I took one look at it, and it was a hit piece against my opponent. Oh, okay. And I, I refused to mail it. I took it out and burned it. I built a fire and burned all but one piece. And when I look at that, and I still have, and I look at that, I think it was just ridiculous. It wasn't hit piece hardly at all compared to what they do now. Yeah. But I decided I was never going to run against other people. I was going to run for myself. 
Mm-hmm. So my entire political career, I never had done a hit piece against my opponent. Very I always, cool. I always just ran on Mary Margaret <laughs> <laughs> and kept my word. Yeah. So when you, <clears throat> what? first of all, when did you decide to run um, for a state representative? What year was that? Oh, it was in the 80s, early 80s. Okay. And was that a big surprise as, as you started telling your family and stuff? Were they surprised? Well, yeah, actually, it's interesting. If you read my all my friends I went to high school said I always knew I'd be involved in politics. Okay. In fact, says, I wanted to be the first woman president. So probably it was a surprise because, you know, here I was a hairdresser. In fact, it's always was interesting because people say, what were you before you went in the legislature? Oh, I was a hairdresser. <laughs> you know, and there's nothing wrong with being a hairdresser. I'm proud of my profession. Mm-hmm. But uh, it really doesn't prepare you like you think it would. <laughs> and uh, I... I I really had to work really hard when I first got in the legislature because I recognized I didn't know everything, and so I had spent my, most of my time learning. But I was always a good government person. I had been active in the League of Women Voters before mm-hmm. I went in there. So I was real fortunate. Within the first two years I was in the legislature, I was, became a committee chairman, and okay. I became chairman of the local government committee. So what does that mean? Well, you, you deal with all the legislation dealing with local governments, like for cities and counties and special districts and such. Okay. And a lot of things I worked on at that time were local government issues, like laws for fire districts and laws for cities and counties and such. Okay. And during that time, we also worked on the Growth Management Act. That bill was actually drafted in my committee. Okay. So I really did spend a lot of time doing good government. Yeah, and what's the, what was the, the basis of the Growth Management Bill? Well, the Growth Management Act at that time, you know, when I went to the legislature, there was only three, three million people living in the state of Washington. Wow. And now there are over 7 million. Wow, that's crazy. So you can see there was a difference. But even at, at that time, the communities were starting to grow. And what had happened was you'd find communities would allow people to build a lot of homes, but they didn't realize they had to build a school if they did that, or they mm-hmm. had to put in a water system or what. So they kept running to the legislature saying, we've got to have money. Oh, okay. And so it was decided that the cities and counties needed to plan yeah. <laughs> for the future. <laughs> that was what it was all about, you know. Yeah. And one of the things we wanted to do was to preserve the environment. You know, for me, it was important for the farms to be preserved, mm-hmm. for the quality of life on this island to be preserved. And so that was part of the Growth Management Act was not only did you have to plan for the future, but you had to preserve what was important. Okay. So then how did, um, when you were working on that and with that project, were you... Um, were you working with ev- all the counties and everything within Washington? Oh, yes, all of them. Okay. Every, every place. Yeah. And I had, you know, I had a lot of small communities. I had all of Whidbey Island my entire political career. I, like I said, I had Darrington and Concrete, Cedar Woolley, Mount Vernon, Arlington. But the district kept shrinking because how it happens is they take the total population of the state and divide it into the 49 legislative districts. Okay. So that's how you get your population base. Okay. So by the time I ended, my district had flattened and gotten fatter. I mean, I still had Whidbey Island and Camino Island, but I had not so much as Skagit County. I had the Valley. Okay. And I had further north in Snohomish County. Okay. And just because I was not very well versed in uh, state legislation, <laughs> um, how does the state of representatives work within the state of Washington, like as far as members and... Um, assignments and stuff like that. Well, of course, the leadership of your party establishes who gets which committees. And I got to be chairman of local government, I think because the guy who was chairman would quit. But <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I had a general interest in local... I had not served on the city council or... or but just been on the school district, but that... Everything went to education committee, but uh, I had an interest in it. And what how you do with that is people come to you with problems they need to have solved... Mm-hmm. And that was one of my specialties. I like to solve problems. And so we would introduce legislation to fix the problem. Okay. And so we deal with lots of, dis- lots of legislation dealing with cities and counties, fire districts. Uh, one of the things I always like to refer to, when I was first in the legislature, Camino Island had five school, had five or three fire districts. There were three fire districts on Camino Island. Okay. There was only one school district, but three fire districts. So we thought it should only be one fire district. Right. Well, I had to change the law three times before I could get the fire commissioners to put it on the ballot. We had to change, <laughs> change the law so they could keep the number. Okay. And I had to change it so that they could have five commissioners instead of 
three. Okay. And it's always interesting to me, when they finally went to the ballot, they ended up with 70% of the people voting for it. I think the people who voted against it were the fire commissioners. <laughs> um, they, what, what's the reasoning behind that? Well, because it's, it was just territorial. Okay. Because, you know, and they did a really good job. It was all volunteer systems, you know, and so they were real proud of their little fire station and yeah. how well they were doing in their own community. But the, putting them all together actually made a better system for this area. So they could organize as... Yeah, and you could know. do more. You could take all your, pull your monies together. You can more buy better trucks and help with... There was a lot of volunteers at that time. One of the legislations I worked with was helping volunteers get a little more money for retirement. Okay. We did. I did a lot during that time. Yeah. Um, so then you were working. Um, so that and then with state representatives, how many of them are there? How many are there in the state of Washington? Well, there's there's actually ninety eight. There's there's actually forty eight legislative districts, and there's two legislators, two representatives, and one senator from each district. Okay. Got it. So there's 49 senators and 98 state representatives. state representatives. Okay. And it was myself. I was a state representative. And at, when I first went in, it was Sim Wilson, who was a newspaper man from Marysville. Okay. So then what is... Um, so as a state representative, I know you were working on different... You worked on the Growth Management Act, and then you also worked with the, the county at the county level as well. Um as a whole, how do I guess what is the where's the difference between what falls under the House of Representatives and their responsibilities and then the Senate and their responsibilities? Well, every piece of legislation has to go through both houses. Okay. Uh, but when you I was chairman of local government, I also served on Natural Resource Committee and did a lot of a lot of legislation dealing with res natural resources. Okay. I served on the education committee too. But when you're in the legislature you serve on more one, more than one committee. But not okay. everybody gets to be a chairman. And okay. when you are chairman, then you, you establish what legislation goes to your committee. And oh, so, okay. And you kind of you, you decide which bills go out of your committee, too. Got it. But uh, every piece of legislation has to pass both houses. Right. Okay. So then when you were in the House, did you do a lot of work? Um, uh, were you working a lot with what was going on with Kameno and stuff? Oh, of course. That time? Okay. You know, my priority was always representing the people. Yeah. And always representing needs of this people of my district. And much of the legislation I introduced was brought to me by people I represented. Okay. You know, like the fire commissioners. That was coming from the fire commissioners. Okay. Uh, you know, from county commissioner Dwayne Kobe. I worked a lot of deals with Dwayne Kobe, things we needed. Office of Public Defense, which I helped create, was something was his idea brought to me, and I was able to introduce the legislation. Okay. Um, just a lot of things that we dealt with. Uh, one of the big concerns at the time was the draggers out in Skagit. The draggers would come through and the boats, you know, the draggers and drag at the bottom of the bay. Okay. And they took all the crab and everything. Well, I actually introduced legislation to get the drag boats out of Saratoga Passage. Okay. <laughs> but that was a local concern. Yeah. You know, and so um, uh, th one of the things we worked on during that time when I was in the house was uh, the wonderful school properties we have in there, like uh, the um, down at... Alger Bay, that old school property, mm -hmm. and then Camino Ridge, they were owned by Department of Natural Resources. Why so introduce legislation which would allow them to be transferred to the counties? Okay. And then I got the money to put put it put it in place. Okay. So one of the things we did was, like I say, something was important. Keystone Spit on Whidbey Island. I worked to preserve that spit. Okay. But it was brought to me by local people. Yeah. So then the so, like, locals and stuff would come to... Sorry, I'm very mm -hmm. ignorant on government and governmental issues. If you ask my wife, she just doesn't even try. Um, but so the like the locals and stuff can come to their state representatives and, and basically bring to attention, like, these are the issues that we see going on. Mm -hmm. This is broken. It needs to be fixed. Mm -hmm. One of the things I spent a lot of time on was cleaning up the statutes. Okay. I, I can say I probably did more cleanup of statutes than anybody else because... Legislature rides into town and passes lots of legislation, and then they leave and they don't look back and see what they did. Okay. And so then they just add more and more and more. When I was in the House, one of the things we did was we consolidated two chapters of law 
were well, exactly the same, but one was dealing with the same one water district and one sewer district. Well, we put the bills together and got rid of all the garbage language in there. Okay. But even people who worked on some little small item trying to deal with the county, and they say, why are you doing it this way? Well, that's what the law says. Well, it doesn't make any sense. So they would come to me, and we then would clean up the law. One of the things I served on was the Municipal Research Service Center, which deals with kind of a service which helps cities and counties kind of clean up the law or understand the laws. Mm-hmm. And so I, went, I was chairman of that for many years. And I used to say, you come to me and tell me, when cities and counties come to you and say, we have a problem understanding what this law does, we'll clean it up. And so that's what I did a lot of time, spending my time cleaning up the statutes. Oh, very cool. Or cleaning up the laws. Yeah. Well, and I know that's something that... Yeah, it, it's because you start getting into something, you're trying to get a project done, like whether you're, you're a business mm-hmm. owner or a homeowner and you're trying to like do something and you run into these laws or something where the county just stops you and you're like, why, why is this a thing? And they're like, well, it's just, it's part of the law. And so that was always something. You know. And that was one of the things I worked on a lot. A lot of people came to me because that's, they'd hit, a, hit the head, you know, head on into a law that didn't make any sense. And, you know, you got to give the counties and cities credit because the law is passed at the legislature and they're following the law. Mm-hmm. And, and it probably doesn't make any sense to the person trying to implement it either. Right. And so we really worked hard to try to clean up those statutes. They're not perfect, but we cleaned a lot of them up. Yeah. And when I became chairman of transportation in the Senate, I worked on transportation laws too. Okay. Because it just didn't make sense. Yeah. And I often think it's really sad that citizens don't realize how much impact they can have on, on a state law. Mm -hmm. Most legislators who are elected, like myself, you know, I was a hairdresser who'd been on a school board. That was my expertise. So when I went in the legislature, I had to learn about a lot of other things. And you don't, you got to be kind of a little bit of an expert on a lot of stuff. Yeah. But people would come to me and say, well, this doesn't make sense. Well, then I would agree it wouldn't make sense. And we'd start researching it. But people need to talk to their legislators because most of them don't know. Right. You know, I didn't know it was a problem. Yeah. But somebody came and told me, then we tried to solve the problem. So I really feel like I became a problem solver because that was my, people come to me and say, this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> One of the silly little bills that I passed it, I had a guy on Whidbey Island who had, was really concerned about the people who would come and take seaweed. They'd back their truck down and harvest the seaweed. A lot of the Asian community would like seaweed and mm-hmm. they just pile it on the back of the pickup and run away with it, go away with it. Yep. There ought to be some limits on how much seaweed any person can get. Well, I didn't know there wasn't a limit. <laughs> so I would talk to the fisheries, and the fisheries said, well, yeah, we don't have anything can, that rules or that governs that, any laws. I said, so, well, we have to put it in place that you can only get so much seaweed. Well, I, we tried to decide how much seaweed you should have. It was always... <laughs> <laughs> well, we decided you had, could have 10 pounds of clam, so you should be able to have 10 pounds of seaweed. Yep. So we passed a law that said you could, ha- you could only take 10 pounds of seaweed at a time, and you had to have a license to do it. So that, so that helped them depleting that harvest. That. Yeah. And then that was a natural resource issue uh, that I worked on. Another one was dealing with merging fisheries. They kept finding new things that people were eating from the sound. Like I remember sea cucumbers. You know, nobody... Yeah ate sea cucumbers, and all of a sudden it became this huge market for sea cucumbers, particularly in the Asian community. The okay. Japanese loved it. And so the fisheries was having a real problem with them because people were harvesting, over-harvesting them. Right. You know, you need to harvest, but you need to have some control. And so they came to the legislature and wanted to put some controls on, which we did. But then I said, why don't you have the ability, when there's an emerging fishery, that you can, by statute, by, by rule, put in some laws to govern how many any kind of species you take. Mm-hmm. So I did introduce legislation giving the Department of Fish and Wildlife the ability to market yeah, or to, to control that market, right. put limits on it, right. whatever came up, right. like sea cucumbers or whatever else they're eating out there now. <laughs> yeah. So <clears throat> um, you were in the House for, how long were you in the House for? I was House for 10 years. 10 years, Okay. Well, a big thank you to Mary Margaret for joining me on the podcast today, and thank you for listening. Be sure to come back next week for part two of this podcast. Uh, And for more information on this episode, you can go to CaminoCommons.com slash EP54. That's CaminoCommons.com slash EP54. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.